Hello and welcome to another episode of the Easy Agile podcast. It's Sean Blake here, your host today. And we're joined by Chris Stone. Chris is going to be a really interesting guest. I really enjoyed recording this episode. Chris is the virtual Agile coach. He's an agility lead, people first champion, vlogger, speaker, and trainer who always seeks to gamify content and create immersive Agile experiences. An Agile convert all the way from back in 2012, Chris has since sought to broaden his experiences, escape his echo chamber, and to fearlessly challenge dysfunction and ask the difficult questions. My key takeaways from this episode were, it's okay to share your failures, the importance of recognizing our mental health, why it's important that work doesn't become stale, how to destigmatize failure, the importance of self-reflection and holding mini self-retrospectives, and the origins of the word deadline. You'll be really interested to find out where that word came from and why it's a little bit troubling. So here we go. We're about to jump in. Here's the episode with Chris Stone on the Easy Agile podcast. Chris, thanks so much for joining us and spending some time with us. Hey there, Sean. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I have to mention, you've got a really funky Christmas sweater on today. And for those people listening in on the audio, they might have to jump over to YouTube just for a section to, to check out this sweater. Can you tell us a bit about where that came from? So this sweater was a gift. Uh, it's a Green Bay Packers, Chris, ugly Christmas jumper is what they call it. And um, I'm a fan of the Green Bay Packers. I've, I've been out there a few times to Wisconsin, Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's so cold out there, in fact, when you're holding a beer in minus 13 degrees, the beer will start to turn to slush just from being outside in the cold air. It's um, it's a great place, very friendly. And uh, the, the jumper was just a, a gift one Christmas from, from someone. Love it. There's nothing better than warm beer, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Chris, um, I first came across you because of the content that you put out on LinkedIn and the way that you go about it, it's, it's so much fun and so different to really anything else I've seen in the corporate space, in the enterprise space, in the agile space even. Um, why have you decided to go down this track of calling yourself the virtual, virtual agile coach, building a personal brand and really putting yourself out there? Well, uh, for me, there, it was an interesting one because COVID this year has forced a lot of people to convert to being virtual workers, remote workers, virtual coaches themselves. Now, what I realized this year is that, you know, the aspiration for many is those co-located teams. It was always, always what people desired. They said, oh, you have to work co-located. It's the best way. Um, and I realized that in my whole agile working life, I'd, I'd never really had that co-located team. There was always some element of distributed working. And you know, the past two years prior to where I am currently in my current company, I was doing distributed scaled agile with you know time zones, including Trinidad and Tobago, Alaska, Houston, the UK, India, and it was all, it was all remote. And I thought, right, this is an opportunity to, well, recognize the fact that I was a virtual agile coach already, but to share with others my learnings, my experiences, the challenges I've faced, the failures I've had uh, with the wider community so they can benefit from it because obviously everyone or, or many have had to make that transition very quickly. And there's lots of learnings there that I'm sure people would benefit from. And this year in particular, uh, I guess the honest answer, the reason for me being, I guess though, out there and, and working more on that side of things, being creative is because it's an outlet for my mental health. Uh, I, I suffer from depression and one of my ways of coping with that is is being creative and creating new content and sharing it. So it's, I guess, it's a reason of, it's, a, it's linked to that also, but also the stories that people tell me afterwards, they motivate me to be keep, me to keep doing it. So when, when someone comes to me and says, hey, uh, I did the Queen retrospective, you know, the Queen rock band retrospective, and this program manager who never smiles connected to the content and admitted he liked queen and smiled and you know this this was a first and you know when people come to us hey we did the the home alone retrospective you know you're one of your christmas themed ones and people loved it it was great you know it, it, it you know it was the most engaging retrospective we've had so far because the problem is work can become stale if you let it be so retrospectives can become this you know what did we do last time what are we going to do next time 
what actions can we do, et cetera, et cetera. And unless you refresh it and try try new things, people will get bored and they'll disconnect and they'll disengage and you're less likely to get a good outcome that way. So for me, there's no reason you can't make work a little bit fun with a little bit of creativity and a little bit of energy and passion about it. Mm, I love that. And do you think a lot of people come to work even when they're working in agile, co-located teams and it's just not fun? Uh, I mean, what do you think the key reasons are that that work isn't fun? I think because it can become stale. Right? It, it's all right. So let's 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 reflect on where we are today. Today we're in a situation where we're not face to face with one another. Right? We don't have time for those water cooler chats. We don't connect over a coffee at lunch or at, or at lunch. We don't uh, have a chat about idle banter and things like that on the way to a meeting room. We don't have any of that. And that forces people to look at each other and see themselves as an avatar behind a screen. Just a name, often in particular, people aren't even on video camera. Um, it forces them to think of people as a name on a screen rather than a beating heart behind a laptop. And it can abstract people into just these entities, these names you talk to day in and day out. And that can force it to be you know, this professional, non-personal interaction. And I'm a firm believer that we need to change that. We need to make things more fun um, because it can, and in my experience does result in much better outcomes you know i'm very i'm very very people first we need to focus on people being people people aren't resources this is a common phrase i i, I like to refer to i love that people aren't resources you spoke a little bit about mental health and your struggle with depression mm -hmm. something that i hear come up time and time again is people that talk about imposter syndrome and I wonder, firstly, if you think that might be exasperated through working remotely now. People are not so sure how they fit in, whether their role is still the same role that it was 12 months ago. And do you have any tips for people when they're dealing with imposter syndrome, especially in a virtual environment? Well, yeah, I, th I think I think this current environment, this virtual environment, you know, the, the pandemic in particular, has led to a number of unhelpful behaviours. You know, there there there's a lot more challenges with people's mental health and, and negativity, and that can only lead to, I guess, less desire, less confidence in in doing things, um, maybe doubting yourself. There is a there's some great visuals I've shared on this recently, and it's all about reframing those um, those imposter thoughts you have, that, that unhelpful thinking, you know, that that thing that goes through your mind that says, oh, they're all going to think I'm a total fraud because maybe I, I don't have enough years of experience, or um, I should already know this. I must get more training, right? There, there's lots of shoulding and musting in that. There's lots of jumping to conclusions in this, and one a couple of ways of getting around that is so if you're thinking of the, the scenario where I'm a fraud think, oh, well, I'm doing my best, but I can't predict what they might think. Uh, when you're trying to think about the scenario of, do I need to get more training? Well, understand and acknowledge the reality that you can't have, you can't possibly know everything. You, know, you continue to learn every single day and that's great, but it's unrealistic to learn, know it all. There's, um, there's a great quote I often refer to and it's true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. I believe it's a, it's, it's a quote from Socrates and it's something that very much resonates with me. Um, you know, over the years I've, gone through this, this learning journey where when I first finished university, for example, I thought I knew everything. I thought yeah, I've, I've got it all. And I'd go out to clients and speak and I'd be like, oh yeah, I know this, I've got this guys. And then the more, more involved I've become and the more deeper I've gone into the topic, the more I realize actually that there's so much that I don't know. And to me, not true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing tells me there's, there's so much out there that I must continuously learn, I must continuously seek to challenge myself each and every day. Um, other people have approached me and said, you know, how, how do you, or what, you know, you, you produce a lot of content, you know, how do you put yourself out there? And I say, well, I just do it. Let's destigmatize failure, right? If, if you put a post out there and it bombs, it doesn't matter. Put another one out there. It's as simple as that, you know, learn from failure, chuck something out there, try it. If it doesn't work, try something else. Now we, we coach agile teams to do this all the time, to experiment, to have a hypothesis, to test against that verify the outcomes and do retrospectives i do weekly solo perspectives yeah i reflect on my my week what works what hasn't worked what i'm going to try differently 
and there's no reason you can't do that also. Mm, okay, so weekly solo perspectives. What a what does that look like, and uh, how do you how do you be honest with yourself about what's working, what's not working, and, and areas for yourself to improve? Um, how do you actually start to have that time for self reflection? Uh, unfortunately, you got to make time for self reflection. Um, one thing I've learned with with mental health is you have to make time for your health before you have to make time for your illness or before you're forced to make time for your illness. And you know, it can become all too easy in this busy working world to not make time for your health, to not make time and focus on you. So you do just have to carve out that time, whether that's blocking some time in the diary on a Friday afternoon just to sit down and reflect, whether that's making time to go out for a walk, you know, setting a, a time on your Alexa to have a five minute stretching break, whatever it is, there's things you can do and you have things you have to do to make time for yourself. With regards to a solo perspective, the way I tend to do things is I tend to journal on a daily basis. That's almost like my own um, my own daily stand up with myself. It's like, what have I what have I observed? What have I what challenges have I faced in the past day? And then that kind of sums up in the, the weekly solo perspective, which is basically a retro for one, where I reflect on, you know, what did I try? What did I want to achieve this week? What, what have, what's gone well? What hasn't gone well? It's the same as a retrospective, just just for one. And it allows me to aggregate my thoughts across the week rather than them being single events so that they're, they're I'm focusing more on the trajectory as opposed to any single outlier. Does that make sense? It does. It does. So you've got this trajectory with your career. You're checking in each week to see whether you're heading in the right direction. I assume that you set, you set personal goals as well along the way. I also noticed that you have personal values that you've I published do. and you've actually published those publicly for other people to, to look at and to see. How important are those personal values in informing your life and personal and career goals? So I'd say that they're hugely important, right? Um, for me, what I thought was we see companies sharing their values all the time. You, know, you, you, you look on company websites and you can see their values quite prominently. And you could probably think, do they often live up to their values? You know, so many companies have customer centricity as their value, but how many of them actually focus on engaging with their customers regularly? How many, how many have a metric that where they track how often they engage with customers? Most of them are focusing on velocity and lead time. So I always challenge, right, are you really customer centric or is that, is that lip service? But moving aside, I digress. I thought companies have values. Why don't, and obviously we do as well, but why don't we share them? Yeah, so I, I, I created this, this visual showing what mine were and challenged a few others to, to share it also. And I had some good feedback from others, which was, which was great. But they, they hugely influence who I am and how I interact on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll give you exa an example. One of my, my values is being open source always. And what that means is nothing I create, no content I create, nothing I produce will ever be behind a paywall. And, and that's, that's me being community driven. That's me sharing what I've learned with others and how, how that's come to fruition, how I've lived that. Is I've had lots of people come to me and say, hey, we love the things you do, you know, you're gamifying things. Would you mind or would you like to collaborate and create this course that people would pay for? And so I was so thoughtful. And I've said, if it's free, yes. But if it's if it's going to be monetized, then no. Right. And, and I've had multiple people reach out to me for that purpose. And I've had to decline respectfully and say, look, I think what you're doing is great. Yeah, you know, you've got a great app. And I can see how having this agile coaching gamification course on there would be of great value. But if it's behind a paywall, then I'm not, I'm not interested because it's, it's in direct conflict with my own values. And therefore, I, won't, I wouldn't, wouldn't be interested in proceeding with it. But keep doing what you're doing. Um, being people first, you know, hashtag people first. I, this, is, this is about me embody, embodying the focus on people being beating hearts behind a laptop rather than just this avatar on a screen. And I, I have this little, you, 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 the, the audio listeners won't be able to sit to see this, but I'm hold, 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 holding up a baby Groot here. And he's like my, my people first totem. And the reason for that is I have a, a group called the Guardians of Agility, and we are people first. That's our emblem. And th these are my transformation champions in my current company. I like to have Guardians of Agility. And um, I've got this totem reminding me to be, to be people first in every interaction I have. So when, for example, I hear the term resources and I'm saying, or 
as soon as I hear it, 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 it almost triggers me. I almost hear it. I go, oh, what, what do I mean by that? And I, I wait a little bit, moment, wait a little moment, and I say, hey, can you can you tell me what you mean by that? And you tease it out a little bit, and often they mean, oh, it's people, isn't it? If you're talking about people, can we refer to them as people? Because people aren't resources. They're not they're not objects or things you mine out of the ground. They're not pens, paper, or desks. They're not chairs in an office. They are people, right? And every time you refer to them as a resource, you abstract them. You make it easier to dehumanize them and think of them as less than. You make it easier to make those decisions like, oh, we can just get rid of those resources or we can just move that resource from here to there into this team and that team, whether they want to or not. Um, so I don't personally like the language. And the problem is it goes all the way back to how it's trained. You go to university and you take a business degree and you learn about human resources. Yep. You you take a course, Agile HR, Agile Human Resources, right? And it's just, it's so prevalent out there. And unless we challenge it, it won't change. So I will happily sit there in a meeting with a CTO and he'll start talking about resources. And I'll say, hey, what do you mean by that? And I'll challenge it and he'll go, yeah, I've done it again. I've not, yes, yes, you have. <laughs> and um, it's gotten to the point now where I'll be on this big group call, for example, and someone will say it and I'll just start doing this on a screen, waving, and they'll go, did it again, didn't I? Yes, you did. So some of these habits are so ingrained from our past experiences, our education, and when you're working with teams for the first time who've never worked in Agile before, they're using phrases like resources, they're doing things that sometimes we call anti-patterns, how do you start to even have that conversation and introduce them to some of these concepts that are totally foreign for people yeah. who've never thought the way that that you or I might, might think about our teams and our work? Sure. So I guess the, the first the first response to that is with empathy. Hmm. I, I'm not I'm not going to blame someone or um, you know, make out like they're a bad person for using words that are ingrained that are normal, right? And this is part of the problem that that term resource is so ingrained in that in that working language nowadays. Same with deadlines. Deadlines are so ingrained, even though deadlines came from a civil war scenario where it referred to if you went past a line, you were shot. Right. How did that land in the business language? Don't know. But um, resources, it's it's so ingrained. It's so entrenched in people's language that people do it without intending to. They don't they often do it without meaning it in, in a negative way. And to be honest, the, the word itself isn't the issue. It's how people actually behave and how, how they treat people. Uh, so my first approach is, is empathy. It's right. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's understand. Hey, why did you use that term? Oh, I, I, I use it to mean this. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. And, and not to, not to do it or call them out in, in, in publicly or things like that. It's, it's doing so with empathy. Now, I often use obviously gamification and uh, training approaches to and, and agile games to introduce concepts. If, if someone's unfamiliar to a certain way of working, I'll often gamify, I'll create something, a virtual agile game to, to demonstrate. And the way I do so is I'm always looking to help people understand how it feels, not just to talk theory. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm a big fan of a game called the virtual name game. This is a game about multi multitasking and context, context switching. And it always begins, I'll ask a group of people, hey guys, can you multitask? And often they'll go, yeah, we can do that. And, and there'll be those stereotypical things like, oh yeah, I'm a woman, I can do that. Or it, it happens, trust me. But one of the first things I do, if I'm face to face with them, I'll say, hey, hold your hands out like this, right? And in your left hand, and people, again, people on the audio can't see me, I'm holding out my, my hands in front of me. In my left hand, we're gonna play an endless game of rock, paper, scissors. And in my right hand, we're going to play in a, a game of we have a thumb wall with each other. And you can try, you can challenge them. Can they, can they do those concurrently? No, they can't. They'll fail because it, you just can't focus on both at the same time. Now, a vir the virtual name game, the way it works, is you divide a group of people up into primarily customers and one developer. And I'll often make the most senior person in the room, that developer. I want them to see how it feels to be constantly context switching. Nice. So if you were the, if you were the uh, developer, you were the senior person in the room, you were the hippo in this scenario, the highest paid person, I would say, sure and right. In this game, these customers, they, they, they are trying to get their name written first on this virtual whiteboard. And we're going to time how long it takes for you to write everyone's name in, total, in totality. The problem is that they're all going to be shouting at you continuously, endlessly, trying to get your attention. So it's going to be Sean, Sean, write my name, write my name. And it's just going to be, well, 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 who do I focus on? You, you won't know. And this, this replicates a scenario that I'm sure many people have experienced. 
he who shouts loudest gets what they want. You know, prioritization is often done by he who, or the person who shouts loudest, not yes. necessarily he. Uh, we then go into another round where, where you say, in this round, Sean, right? People are going to be shouting their name at you, but in this round, you're going to pay a little bit of attention to everyone. So the way you're going to do that is you're going to write the first letter of one person's name, then you move on to the first letter of the next person's name, and you're going to keep going around. The consequence of that is everyone gets a little bit of attention, but the result is it's really slow, mm. right? You're starting lots of things, but not finishing them. And, and again, each, in each round, we're exploring how it feels. How did it feel to be in that round? Sean, you were being shouted at. How did that feel? You know, everyone else, you were shouting to get your attention. You had to shout louder than other people. How did that feel? And it's frustrating. It's demotivating. It's not enjoyable. And the final round, we say, hey, Sean, in this round, I'm going to empower you to decide whose name you write first. And you can write the whole thing in order. And the, and the, the guys, actually, they're going to they're gonna help you this time. They're not going to shout over each other. They're going to help you. Uh, and in this scenario, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, it feels far better. The result is people finish things, you know, the, and you can measure the output of the number of names written and the, and the time frame. It's a very quick and easy way of demonstrating how it feels to be constantly context switching and the damage it can have if, for example, yeah, you prioritize things into a sprint and you've got lots of people all, all trying to reorder things and so on and so forth and lots of pressure from external people that ideally should be shielded from influencing this and that and how, how that feels and what the, the result is. Because you may start something, get changed onto something else. You've got to take mindset out of this back into something else. And then the person who picks up the original thing might even not even be the same person. So they've got to learn that over again. There's just lots of waste and inefficiency caused through that. And that's just an example of a, a game I use to bring that sort of things to life. That's great. That's fantastic. I love that. And I think we need to, at Easy Agile, start playing some of those games because there's a, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from going through those exercises. And then when you see it play out in real life, in the work that you're doing, it's easier to recognize it then. If you've done the training, you've done the exercise that all seems like fun and games at the time, but when it actually rears its head, uh, in the work that you're doing, it's much easier to call it out and say, oh, we're, we're doing that thing that, that we had fun playing, and we, but now we realize it's, it's occurring in real life and let's, let's go a different direction. So I can see how that would be really powerful for teams to go through that. So Chris, I'd also add yeah. that every, every, every game that I do, um, I construct it using the four C's approach. So I'm looking to connect people, firstly connect people to each other, and then to the subject matter. So in, in this game, it's about multitasking. I then look to contextualize why that matters. Why does context, what does, what does context switching and multitasking matter in the world of work? Because it causes inefficiencies, because it causes frustration, demotivation, et cetera. Then we do some concrete practice. We play, play a game that emphasizes how it feels. And at the end, we draw conclusions. And the idea is that with the conclusion side of things, it's almost like a retrospective on the game. We say, hey, what did we learn? What challenges did we face? And what can we do differently in our working world? And that helpfully leaves people with actual takeaways. A lot of the content I share is, is aiming to leave people with actual takeaways, not just talking about something, but reflecting on what you could do differently, what you could try, what experiment you might like to employ with your working life, your team, that might help improve a situation you're facing. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. And you've spoken about this concept of agile sins. And we know that a lot of companies have these values. They might have committed to an agile transformation. They might have even gone and, and trained hundreds or thousands of people at a company using similar tactics and, and coaching and education experiences that you provide. Uh, but we still see sometimes things go terribly wrong. And I wonder, what's this concept of agile sins that you talk about? And how, how can we start to identify some of these sins that, that pop up in our day-to-day -day work with each other? I guess, so the first thing I would, I would emphasize about this is that using sin, um, it's a very dogmatic religious language and it's more, it's more being used satirically than with any real intent. So I just like to get that across, right? I'm not a dogmatic person. I don't believe there is any utopian solution. I certainly don't believe there's any one size fits all situation for, for anyone. So the idea that there's really any actual sins is, yeah, take that with a pinch of salt. The, 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 the reason the agile sins came up is because I was, I was part of a, another podcast recently with a guy called Charles Lindsay, and he does this agile confessional. And it's about one coach confessing to another their mistakes, you know, their sins, the things they've done wrong. 
And I loved it because I'm all about destigmatizing failure. I'm all, all about sharing with one another these war stories from one coach to another, because I've, I've, I've been a proponent of this in the past. I've shouted, hey, look, I, I failed on this. I made this mistake. I learned from it. And I challenge others to do so as well. And there's still this reluctance by many to share what went wrong. And it's because failure is this dirty word. It's got this stigma attached to it. No one wants to fail, uh, leaders in particular. So the, the podcast was, was a great experience. And it was interesting for me because that was the first time I've given confession. Because <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm someone who is used to taking confession myself. I, I go to this hockey festival every year and I got, I got given years ago this, this archbishop outfit and I kind of made that role my own, right? I was drunk and I said, right, you're going to confess your, your sins to me. And if they hadn't sinned enough, I tell them to go and do more. And I would give them penitence with alcohol and shots and things like that. And I've actually <laughs> baptized people in this paddling pool whilst drunk. Anyway, again, I digress, but I, w I wasn't used to confessing myself. Usually I was taking confession, but I, I did so. And, and it was a good experience to share some of my failures. And my penitence was to create, and it was my own idea, to create my, my videos, seven videos of my seven agile sins. And again, it, this was just me sharing my mistakes, what I've learned from it with the help of it, the, the intent of it benefiting others to mm. avoid those similar sins. Mm. So you've spoken to a lot of other agile coaches. You've heard about their failures. You confessed your own failures. Is it possible for you to summarize down what are those ingredients that make someone a great coach? Ooh, now that's, that is, that is a question. What makes someone a great coach? I think it's going to be entirely subjective to be honest. And my, my personal view is that a great coach listens more than they speak. Okay. That's that, I guess that would be a huge starting point. They listen more than they speak because I've, and this is one of the things I've been guilty of in the past is I've allowed my own biases to influence the team's direction. Um, and an approach I'd taken in the past was, hey, I'm working with this team and, oh, this has worked well in the past. We're going to do that. Rather than, so guys, what have you done so far? What have you tried? What, what, what's worked well? What hasn't worked well? What can we create or what can we try next that works for you guys? Let's have you make that decision. And I'm here to guide you through that process to facilitate it rather than to direct it myself. And that, again, I find a pr and is, is an approach that resonates more with people. They, they feel that they own that decision as opposed to it being forced upon them. And there's far less, I guess, cognitive dissonance as a consequence. Um, so listen, listening, more, listening more than speaking is a huge, for me, uh, point that an agile coach should do. Another thing I think for me nowadays is that there's, there's too much copy and pasting and what I mean by that is, you know, the Spotify, the Spotify model came out years ago and everyone went, oh, this is amazing. We're, we're going to adopt it. We're going to have tribes and chapters and guilds and squads, and it's going to work for us. That's, that's, that's our culture now. It's like, well, let's, let's just take a moment here. Spotify never intended for that to happen. They don't even follow that model themselves anymore. <laughs> you know, you, what you've done there is you've just tried to copy and paste another model and then people do it with safe as well. They just say, hey, we're going to, take the whole safe framework and chuck it into our, our system in this blueprint style cookie cutter. And the problem is, is that it doesn't take into account for me, the most important variable in any sort of transformation initiative, the people, what they want and their, and the, the culture there. So this is, this is where another one, one of my values is innovate, don't replicate. Work with people to experiment and find their agile what works for them rather than just copy and pasting things. So tailor it to their needs rather than just coming in with some all singing and dancing framework. And then the way I do it is I say, Hey, well, safe is great. Well, it's got lots of values and lots of great things about it. Lots of benefits to it, but maybe not all of it works for us. Let's borrow a few tenants of it. Same with less, same with scrum at scale, same with scrum, same with Kanban. There's, there's lots of little things you can borrow from various frameworks. But there's also lots of things you can inject yourself, lots of things you can try that work for you guys and ultimately come up with your own tailor-made solution. So innovate, don't replicate would be another one for me. Um, learning, learning fast and learning often and, and, and 
and living and breathing that yourself. Another mistake I and other coaches I think have, have made is not making time for your own personal development to allowing, you know, day in, day out to just be busy, busy, busy. Yeah. But at the same time, you're going out there coaching teams. Hey, you've got to learn all the time. You've got to try new things, but not, not making that time for yourself. So I always carve out time to do that, to attend conferences, to read books, to challenge myself and escape my echo chamber, not just to speak to the same people I do all the time, but perhaps to go on a podcast with people I've never spoken to, to a different audience, maybe to connect with people that actually disagree with me because I want that. I want, I don't want that homophilous thinking where everyone thinks exactly like I do, because then I don't get exposed to the perspectives that, that make me think differently. So I, I'm often doing that. Like, how can I attend a conference that I know nothing about? Maybe it's a project management focus one. It's, you know, project management and waterfall isn't a dirty word either. It's, yep. you know, there is no utopian system. Yep. Project management and or traditional project management and waterfall has its benefits in certain environments, you know, environments with less, you know, less flexible scope or, or less frequently changing requirements works very well. I, I always say GDPR, which is a, a an EU legislation yep. around data protection, that was like a two year thing in the making and, and everyone knew exactly what was happening and when they had to do it by. That was a great example of something that could be done very well with a waterfall style because the requirements weren't changing. But if you are trying to develop something for a customer base that changes all the time, um, and you've got lots of new things and lots of competitors and things like that, then it varies. And, and probably the, the ability to iterate frequently and learn from it is going to be more beneficial. And this is where Agile comes in. So I guess to sum up there, there's a, there's a few things. Learning fast, learning often. Um, I can't even remember the ones I've, 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 I've mentioned now. I've, I've gone off on many tangents and this is what I do. I love it. It's, it's great advice, Chris. It's, it's really important and timely. Uh, and, and you mentioned around the, the customer base that's always changing and we know that technology is always changing and and things are only going to, to change more quickly and disruptions only going to be more severe going forward can you look into the future or do you ever look into the future and and say what are those trends that are emerging in the agile space or or even in in workplaces that are going to disrupt us in the way that we do our work uh, what does Agile look like in, in five or 10 years? Now, that, again, is a, is a very big question. I can sit here and postulate <laughs> and talk about what it might look like. Uh, I'm going to draw upon what I think is a, a great example of what will shape the next five to 10 years. In February 2021, there is a festival called Agile 20 Reflect. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. No. And... It's, it's billed as a festival, not a conference. It's really important. So it's modeled on the Edinburgh Festival. And what it intends to be is a celebration of the, the past, the present, and the future of Agile. Now, what it is, it's a month long series of events on Agile. And anyone can create an event and speak and share, and it will create this huge community um, driven load of content that will be freely accessible and available. Now, there are three of the original manifest, uh, Agile Manifesto signatories that are involved in this. Lisa Adkins is involved in this. There's lots of big name speakers that are attached to this festival. And I myself am running a series of retrospectives on the Agile Manifesto. I've, I've interviewed Ari Van Bedeken, one of the uh, original Agile Manifesto signatories. There are going to be lots of events out there. And I think that festival will begin to shape in some way, what Agile might look like, because there's lots of lots of events, lots of speakers, lots of panel discussions that are coming up, coming together with lots of professionals out there, lots of practitioners out there that will begin to shape what that looks like. So whilst I could sit here and and, and postulate on it, um, I'm not the expert to be honest, and and there are there are far greater minds than I. And actually, I'd rather leverage the power of the the wider community in in coming to that than suggesting my own at this time. Nice, I like it. And what you've done there, you've made it impossible for us to clip this video and prove you wrong in the future when you predict something that doesn't end up happening. So that's very, <laughs> very wise of you. Future proof myself. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Chris, I think we're coming almost to the end now, but I wanted to ask, given the quality of your, your Christmas sweater, uh, do you have any tips for teams who are working over the, the holiday period? Um, then 
most likely burnt out after a really difficult 2020. Uh, what are some of the things you'd say to, to coaches or to agile teams as they come into this time where hopefully people are able to take some time off, spend some time with their family? Uh, do you have any, any tips or, or recommendations for, for how people can look after their mental health look after their peers and and spend that time in in self-reflection sure so uh, a number of number of things that i i definitely rec- would recommend i'm i'm currently producing and sharing this this agile advent calendar and the idea is that every day you get a new bite-sized piece of agile knowledge or, or a template or something wacky and zany or a video whatever it may be there's lots of little things going in there and there's 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 been retro templates, Christmas and festive themes. So there's a Home Alone one, a Die Hard one, an Elf movie one. There's, there's all sorts. So perhaps try one of those as a, as a fun, immersive way with your team to just reflect uh, reflect on you know, the recent times as a squad um, and perhaps come up with some things for the next year. And there's, for example, the, the Die Hard one. It's based on the, the quotes from the movie Die Hard, right? So it's got Yippie Kai in there celebrate you know your um, celebrate and give kudos to, to certain members of your team or there's one in there about you know if this was um if this is how you celebrate christmas i can't wait for new year and and, and that in that question was saying you know what do we want to try next year right this year's been great what do we want to try differently next year so there's there's uh, there's opportunities through those templates to to reflect in a fun way to give one of those a go um i i, I shared some christmasy festive zoom backgrounds or team backgrounds give those a go you know make it make it a bit fun make it a bit immersive uh there's christmas or festive icebreakers that you can use what I, what I tend to do is any meeting i facilitate the first five minutes is just unadulterated chat about non-work things yeah and i often use icebreakers to do so and whether that's a question like if you could have the legs of any animal what would you have and why <laughs> sean what would that be probably a giraffe because just the, the height advantage it sure. has got to be something that's useful in everyday life fancy take on lebron maybe yes yes yeah, you, you nice. would definitely need that although i don't think i would fit in the lift on the way to work so that would be a problem yeah there's some disadvantages to that too yes. but yeah that, that's just a question because it's interesting to see what people come up with but there's some festive ones too you know what's your favorite christmas flick what would put you on the the, the naughty list this year um are, you know do does um does your family have any weird or quirky Christmas traditions, right? Because I love hearing about those. Everyone's everyone's got their own little thing. Whether it's oh we open one Christmas present on on Christmas Eve or yeah. every every Christmas day we get a pizza together. You know, there's there's some really random ones that come out. Um, I love hearing about those. So making time for that personal interaction, but in a festive way, can help as well. And then on the mental health side of things, I I very much subscribe to the Pomodoro effect from a productivity side of things. So I will I will use that, I'll set myself a timer, I'll focus without distractions, do something, and then in that five minute break, I'll just get up and move away from my desk and stretch and mm. get a coffee, whatever it may be. But then I'll also block out time. And I know some companies in this remote working world at the moment are saying, hey, every one till 2 p.m. is is blocked out time for you guys to go and have a walk. Right? Some people have, some companies are doing that. Nice. I always make time to get out and away from my desk because that, enables me to be more productive and it breaks up my day a little bit so i definitely recommend that getting some fresh air can do wonders for your mental health awesome well chris i've learned so much from this episode and i really appreciate you spending some time with us today um we've talked about a lot of things from around the importance of sharing your failures the importance of looking after your mental health checking in on yourself and your own development but also how, how are you tracking, how are you feeling? Um, I love that quote that you shared from, we think it's Socrates, that true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. I think that's that's really important. Every day is starting from, from day one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, destigmatizing failure, uh, the origins of the word deadline, I did not know that. That's really interesting. Um, and just asking that simple question, how did that feel? How did yeah. that feel working in this way? People screaming your name, walk up work um, when work's too busy how, how does that feel and is that is that a healthy feeling that everyone should have so there's some really important questions for me to reflect on and i know our audience uh, will really appreciate those questions as well 
So thanks so much, Chris, for, for joining us on the Easy Agile podcast. Not a problem. Thank you for listening and uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas.